Welcome back to complex variables. Let's now introduce harmonic functions and talk about harmonic conjugates, which are some pretty important concepts in complex analysis. We'll start with harmonic functions. Say I have a function u of x and y, where x and y are real numbers and u is a real valued function, meaning that it spits out a real number for a given value of x and y. Suppose also that u is continuous and has continuous partial derivatives of the first and second order in x and y, and this continuity in the partial derivatives and in u occurs over a domain d that's a subset of r. If u meets all of these conditions, and if u satisfies the second order partial differential equation where the second partial of u in x plus the second partial of u in y equals zero in the domain d, then u is known as a harmonic function in the domain d. This equation, by the way, this partial differential equation is called Laplace's equation, which you would know if you've done some PDEs. And these harmonic functions, by the way, are quite important in physics as they have plenty of applications, which is why it's worthwhile to go over them here. But before we get to those applications, we're going to start by proving an important theorem related to harmonic functions. This theorem states that if I have a complex function f of z with the real part u and the imaginary part v, and if this function is analytic in some domain d on the complex plane, then the component functions u and v are both harmonic functions in that domain. Note that z here is your generic complex number given by the sum of x and y times i, and the i is your usual imaginary number, i squared equals negative 1, which you're well familiar with. The proof of this theorem is trivial. It actually is though. If you recall my earlier videos on complex variables, then you'll know that if f of z is an analytic function, the real and imaginary parts of f of z, the u and the v, must satisfy the cauchy raymond relations given by the following equations, which I'll label equations 1 and 2. If I take both of these equations and differentiate both sides of equations 1 and 2 with respect to x, my first equation will become the second partial of u in x on the left and the mixed partial of v on the right. Meanwhile, my second equation will become the mixed partial of u with respect to x and y and the negative second partial of v with respect to x. I'll label these equations 3 and 4 respectively. If I then take equations 1 and 2 again and differentiate both sides with respect to y this time, I'll get the following. For the first equation, I'll have the mixed partial on the left for u, the second partial with respect to y on the right for v, and then for the second equation, I'll have the second partial in y on the left for u, and the mixed partial on the right for v. And I'm going to label these equations 5 and 6 respectively. Let's now combine these equations. We'll start by adding equations 3 and 6. When we do that, we'll get the sums of the second partials of u in x and y on the left, and the difference between the mixed partials of v on the right. Now, recall from basic multivariable calculus that if v is a nice continuous function with continuous second partial derivatives, then its mixed partial derivatives are equal. It doesn't matter what order we partially differentiate with respect to x and y, the end result is the same. This is called Clairaut's theorem, by the way, and because of Clairaut's theorem, my right-hand side up here becomes zero. And when this happens, I find that the sum of the second partials of u in x and y equals zero, which means that u by definition is a harmonic function in our domain of interest. But what about v? Well, here what I'll do is subtract equations four and five. When I do that, I get the following. Again, the left-hand side becomes zero because the mixed partials are equal according to Clairaut's theorem. This means that the sum of the second partials of v in x and y is zero, which means that v is also a harmonic function in our domain of interest. And this completes the proof of our theorem. The real and imaginary parts u and v of an analytic complex function f of z are both harmonic functions. So now that we've discussed some preliminaries behind harmonic functions, let's go further and delve into harmonic conjugates. Let's suppose that u and v are two functions of x and y that are both harmonic functions in the domain d, so they satisfy Laplace's equation in that domain. v is said to be a harmonic conjugate of u if the following relationships are satisfied. The first is that the partial of u in x equals the partial of v in y, and the second is that the partial of u in y equals the negative of the partial of v in x. Keep in mind that this isn't the same as the complex conjugate, it's the harmonic conjugate.
Now, these equations might look familiar, and they should because they're the cauchy raymond relations. So the definition of the harmonic conjugate is straight up the same as the cauchy raymond relations. Recall way back again from my video on the cauchy raymond relations that for a complex function f of z consisting of a real part u and imaginary part v, for this function to be analytic, u and v have to have continuous partial derivatives in x and y, and the cauchy raymond relations have to be satisfied in that domain of interest. So these three conditions must hold. So if we use this logic, we can make the argument that if v is a harmonic conjugate of u in the domain d, then the complex function f composed of the real part u and the imaginary part v must be analytic in d. Why is that? Well, because all three of these conditions will be satisfied. u and v will have partial derivatives that are continuous in x and y. This is obviously true because u and v are harmonic functions, so they must have valid partial derivatives. In addition, because v is a harmonic conjugate of u, the cauchy raymond relations are also satisfied because, as we just showed, the harmonic conjugate relationship looks exactly like the cauchy raymond relations. The converse of this statement is also true. If f of z, composed again of the real part u and imaginary part v, if f of z is analytic in a domain d, then v is a harmonic conjugate of u. Why is that? Well, because if f of z is analytic, then the cauchy raymond relations hold true. And if the cauchy raymond relations hold true, then v by definition is a harmonic conjugate of u. And so because this statement and its converse are true, we have essentially proven the theorem that a function f of z composed of u plus v times i is analytic in a domain d if and only if v is a harmonic conjugate of u. Hopefully that should all make sense. Now before we end this video, let's do a quick example. Suppose I have a function u given by the hyperbolic sine of x times the regular sine of y. There's two parts to this example. The first is to show that u is a harmonic function, and the second is to find its harmonic conjugate. We'll start with part a, which is actually pretty simple. It involves using the definition of the harmonic function to take the second partial with respect to x and the second partial with respect to y. So we'll start by the first step, which is to take the first partials with respect to x and y. If we take the first partial of u with respect to x, then we get cosine x times sine y. Of course, the sine y gets treated as a constant when we differentiate with respect to x, so all we end up doing is the derivative of sinh, which is just cosine. If we take the second partial in x of u, again, we just worry about the derivative of the cosine, which is hyperbolic sine, and we're done. If we now take the partial of u with respect to y, then we don't have to worry about the sinh this time, just the sine y, and the derivative of sine, as you probably know, is just cosine. Similarly, if we take the second partial of u and y, we get the following. And if we add these two second partials, this is what we end up with, which really just totals out to zero. So we've confirmed essentially that u is indeed a harmonic function, because it satisfies this partial differential, this Laplace equation. Let's now find the harmonic conjugate of u. Using the definition of the harmonic conjugate, we know that v is a harmonic conjugate of u if these following relationships are satisfied. So if we plug in the partials of u with respect to x and y, we get two partial differential equations for the derivatives of v as follows. Let's now integrate the first expression with respect to y. When we do that, our cosine can be treated as a constant, so we just have to integrate the sine y with respect to y which is just negative cosine y. Of course, we also have to add a constant of integration, but in this case, since we've only integrated with respect to y, our constant of integration will actually be a function of x. After all, a function of x here is basically a constant when you go back and take the partial derivative of this with respect to y. Let's now integrate the second equation, the partial of v in x, with respect to x. When we do that, all we have to do is integrate the hyperbolic sine, which is actually just cosine, so this is what we get. This time our constant of integration is a constant function in y, which makes sense because if you partially differentiate this expression with respect to x, the constant function of y will go away and then you'll get the partial of v in x as the negative hyperbolic sine of x times the cosine of y. But now we have to make sure that the v's we got from both integrations are consistent. And the only way to get that to happen is for these constant functions to be equal to each other. And the only way to get a function of x to be equal to a function of y is to have them both just be constants. 
I can't make an exclusive function of y contain an x term, and I can't make an exclusive function of x contain a y term. The only way I can do that is if I make c1 and c2 constants, and equal constants, and I'll write that equal value of that constant as capital C. So finally, the harmonic conjugate of u of cinch x times sine y is given by the negative cosine x times cosine y plus some integration constant. Anyway, that should do it for this video on harmonic functions and harmonic conjugates. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.